Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and this is Bits of Architecture. So in this episode of the series, we're going to have an introduction to performance. So oftentimes as computer architects, we're asked to compare the performance of different architectures. So we want to know, say, which one is better, right? Which one has better performance? But what exactly does better performance mean, right? This can be somewhat of a tricky question. And to understand why, let's look at this simple non-computer related example. So let's say that we have these three different categories of vehicles. So say our sports cars, our sedans, and our tour buses. And someone asks us, which one is the best? Right, so each of these categories has their own characteristics. So for example, our sports cars are fast, but they have limited seating, right? Maybe they only sit one or two people. And they typically have pretty poor fuel efficiency per person. Now on the other side of things, we have something like a tour bus, right? So our tour bus is much slower by comparison, but has quite a lot of seating, so it may seat up to 60 people or more. And as a result, it has pretty good fuel efficiency, at least per person. And then somewhere in the middle here, we have things like a sedan, right? So it has moderate speed, it has moderate seating, so more than a sports car, but much less than something like a tour bus. And it has decent fuel efficiency, at least per person. So which of these is the best, right? So just like we'll see um, in a lot of cases with respect to performance, the answer is going to be, it depends, right? So it really depends on what our, our goal is, right? So if we want to get from say point A to point B the fastest, maybe the sports car is our best option. But if we want to say, get the most people from point A to B in the shortest amount of time, it might be something like a tour bus. And then likewise, if our goal is somewhere in the middle, it might be something like a sedan. Right? So, you know, what we consider the best really depends on what we're trying to do. And things get even more, you know, confusing or more difficult for us to decide of what's the best, because inside of each of these categories, there are going to be plenty of options. So there are a number of different sedans out there, there are a number of different sports cars out there, each with slightly different options, right? So some might be faster, some might be slightly more fuel efficient. So this method of, or rather this process of deciding what's the best, is rather complicated. So the core takeaway here is the best choice depends on our needs, right? And the answer is rarely clear cut. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about some of these performance metrics. So how do we actually quantify performance when we're talking about um, architectures or computing systems? So two of the th main things we use are um, ex execution time and throughput. So by execution time, we just mean the total time it takes to complete a task. So maybe it takes 10 seconds to run some application. We also use throughput, right? Also known as bandwidth. And, band, and when we're talking about throughput or bandwidth, we're talking about you know, the number of tasks we can complete per unit time. So maybe we can run you know, 10 tasks per second or 10 tasks per minute, right? That'll be our throughput. Now we can improve our execution time and this will also improve our throughput. So if we say improve our execution time from 10 seconds to five seconds, we've essentially doubled our throughput. So we can now do, you know, run two tasks, right? In 10 seconds instead of just one task. However, if we improve our throughput, this doesn't in, uh, improve our execution time, right? So instead of, you know, running all of our tasks on say a single processor, right? One after another, we could run them across two processors. Right? So maybe two processors can each run a task that takes 10 seconds. So we haven't made that individual task any faster, right? It still takes 10 seconds to run, but we can run two of them at the same time. So speaking about execution time, we should talk about the, our time spent in the CPU. So at the very top here, we have our total execution time, right? And sometimes we refer to this as our wall clock time. So this is you know, the time from when we start our application until we see that our application finishes. That'll be our total execution time. However, our processor or CPU might not actually be working on our application for this entire duration, right? There might be some time that our CPU is actively working on our program, and then other times where our program just simply isn't scheduled. So our CPUs are often working on a number of different things, so it'll schedule between these different tasks going on. So sometimes our program will be scheduled, other times it won't be. Now within our CPU execution time, which is the time our CPU act is actively working on our task, that can further be broken up into our user CPU time and our system CPU time. Right, so our user CPU time is our time spent right, actually inside of our application, running our code, 
And then our system CPU time is time spent in the operating system on behalf of our program. So maybe handling things like IO, right? So both of these things contribute to our total CPU execution time. So we we'll often refer to you know, our user CPU time, CPU time as our time spent in user space, and our system CPU time as our time spent, say, in kernel space. Okay, so now that we know a little bit more about performance, performance is really all about ratios, right? It's the ratios of performance between you know, different architectures and different systems running different tasks. So we typically define performance, right? So the performance of you know, some architecture you know, X running some application is equal to one over the execution time, right? So how long does it take to run that application on this architecture? And this makes it really nice to compare, say, the performance of two different systems. So if we want to compare, say, the performance X compared to the performance Y, so we want to know how much faster X is than Y, we can just take the execution time of Y over the execution time of X. So just substituting this one over execution time for both X and Y here. Now, as a practical example of this, let's say, you know, computer X runs an application in 10 seconds and computer Y runs an application in 15 seconds. And we want to know how much faster is our architecture X at running this application compared to Y. Well, that would just be our execution time of Y over our execution time of X. So 15 over 10. Um, and that'll give us a ratio of 1.5. So our architecture X is 1.5 times faster at running that application. So another way you could think about it is that in the time it takes us to run, you know, our program on the architecture Y once, we could have run it one and a half times on, you know, our architecture X. So we can't talk about performance without talking about the clock, right? So the clock in our processors is this, this part of our processor that generates this oscillating signal. So it'll be something like this square wave that's oscillating between zero and one. And this is really the driving force behind execution inside of our processors. So all of our, uh, all of our components inside of our processor will be connected to this clock. And as we hit either say a rising edge or a falling edge, right? That'll trigger, you know, our state to update. So our state will move along say between different stages in our pipeline, right? So, and this synchronizes all those things. So they all update together, right? So that's what we use a clock for. Now our clock cycle, right, it's just one period um, of the signal, right? So just say right here. So starting from being flat here, you know, rising edge all the way to the falling edge before that, part, that small part of the signal repeats again. Now when we're talking about CPUs and, you know, other, other accelerators, we're typically top, talking about them in terms of, you know, how you know, quickly or how many clock ticks or clock cycles we have in a second, right? And that'll be the frequency. Um, that our device runs at. So that'll be measured in Hertz, right? And hertz is just occurrences per unit time. So it's the units is one over seconds. So for example, right, you know, modern CPUs will run at 3.5 gigahertz, right? Or four gigahertz, right? And that's just the, uh, that's just the frequency of uh, our, our clock cycles, right? So how many clock periods do we have um, per second, right? That'll be that frequency number. So for example, if something is 20 kilohertz, it'll be 20,000 clock periods in a second, right? That'll be our frequency of our device. Now we often talk about our instructions in terms of how many cycles they take to execute, right? Because again, right, our cycles, right, each period of a cycle, each tick, right, that's going to be, you know, the driving force behind our execution. So you wanna know basically how many small steps does it take to execute an instruction? So let's talk about instruction performance and some of the metrics we use. So a very common one will be this clock cycles per instruction or cycles per instruction, CPI. And this is just the average number of clock cycles that it takes per instruction, right, to execute an instruction. But we often use the inverse of this number actually, right, which will be IPC, instructions per cycle. Um, so this is incredibly common in computer architecture. And the reason why is because CPI can be a little bit non-intuitive to people. So typically, you know, as humans, when we're thinking about data, we typically think of say higher or the higher number as being better. So CPI is a little bit of the inverse, right? So a high CPI means we have lots of clock cycles to execute a single instruction, but a high IPC means we can execute many instructions in a single cycle, right? Um, 
so we often use IPC instead of CPI, but they're really just kind of the same no number, just the inverse of each other. Now, how do we actually use something like CPI or IPC? Well, we can use it to give us an estimate or to measure our execution time. So, you know, our execution time of a program on our CPU will be our CPI, our average clock cycles per instruction, times the number of instructions we have inside of our program. So after we execute our program, we've executed a number of instructions, right? So we'll have this instruction count. And then we multiply this by our clock period. So how long is each clock cycle? And that'll give us our execution time, right? So our, the number of clock cycles we can do per, or we have per instruction, times the number of instructions, times the duration of our, uh, or times our clock period. Now to predict performance, um, we often care about the individual class of instructions. So it's very rare that every single one of our instructions takes the exact same amount of time. So we end up using more of this summation here, where we'll do the sum of you know, the CPI of each individual category of instructions times the number of instructions within that category. So our CPI of i times C of i. Right? And we'll take the sum of that, and that'll be our total number of cycles. And then we can multiply that by our clock period, and that'll give us our execution time of our CPU. Right? Again, that'll just be how long it'll take to execute all these instructions, not counting things like the time where our operating system deschedules our program. Okay, so performance is filled with caveats. Right? So as we said earlier, we have this, this very common answer in performance of it depends. So let, let's look at a couple questions here, right? So does a higher CPI on one machine mean it's slower than another machine, right? That has a lower CPI? And the answer is it depends, right? So all we did here was we talked about CPI. We didn't say anything about the frequency of these devices. So two devices may have, you know, the exact same CPI. So maybe a CPI of 10, right? On average, it takes 10 cycles per instruction. But one device might operate at one megahertz frequency and another device can operate at a gigahertz frequency, right? Clearly, they're not going to have the same performance. Now, another thing we also haven't talked about is that we're when we're comparing different architectures, the instructions and what the instructions do might not be identical. So in some architectures, there's a lot more work packed into a single instruction than other architectures where you know, all of the instructions are fairly um, they're, they're these primitive operations, so they don't do a lot of work, but they execute very quickly. So those things will also impact things like CPI. Okay, so going into our next question, does a machine having a higher CPI on one application mean it's worse than another machine? And the answer is, it depends. A lot of times, you know, we want our computers to be good across a range of applications, not a single application. So while a machine may be bad on a particular application and have a high CPI in that application, that doesn't mean it's worse across all of the different applications. So applications stress different things. Some might be very compute bound, some might be very memory bound or IO bound, and some might be a mix of all three. So be, having a high CPI on one application doesn't mean that you know, our processor is worse than another processor. And then the final question we have here is, do instructions always take a fixed length of time? And the answer is you know, generally no, right? So which, which makes you know, information like IPC or CPI not always the best metric, right? So for example, an add or a multiply instruction, those will generally take some fixed length of time, right? Except for maybe any dependencies that might exist. However, think about something like a memory access, right? We've talked a bit about, a, about the memory hierarchies we have. So it takes a very different amount of time to access memory if it's inside of our L1 cache or L2 cache or out in main memory or off on a disk someplace. So clearly those memory instructions, those loads and stores are not going to take the same amount of time, right? So these are just some important things to keep in mind when we think about performance and how we might you know, estimate you know, if we're gonna have good performance or bad performance and why our performance is the way that it is. And at the end of the day, our ground truth in terms of performance is going to be our execution time. So how long does it take to execute our program in seconds? That's going to you know, trump everything else like you know, our CPI or our IPC. You know, we're primarily concerned about how long does it take to run. Okay, so that's gonna go ahead and do it for this time. It's a brief introduction to performance. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.